Good morning and hope your Bibles are open to 2 Thessalonians and we do rejoice uh, that you're here with us and you may be following along last week's message on Facebook or YouTube. We welcome you as well. What a wonderful crowd this morning and it is delight to see you. Some of you are here for the first time, some of you are, are been able to come back and so we thank the Lord for that. Finally, finally, don't you like it when you get in your life to a finally, when you can get to a finally and that's where Paul is in 2 Thessalonians. Finally, now Brother Benny will repeat uh, the, the sessions from 1 Thessalonians. We have that now. Last week is on, uh, it pulled up on Wednesday, so the Wednesday nights are on there for a little while. Thanks to Brother Roger and Caitlin getting those on. And uh, he has another session this coming Wednesday night. So from 1 Thessalonians. So we're overlapping a little bit about end times and preparing ourselves. But not to survive today, how to thrive. Uh, in a new America. Finally, I am so happy that anytime I can get to my life when we get to a finally. And when we, when we look at finally, he says in chapter 3, verse 1, finally, my brethren, pray. So the number one thing that he rounds up the book, and we'll have to go back to chapter 1, and we're going to do that. But in chapter 3, he's giving them the finally, which is, I need you to pray. And I want you to pray in earnest about these things. Finally, finally, my brethren, pray that the word of the Lord may run swiftly. Did you ever see that before in scripture? It's the only time it's ever printed that the word of the Lord may run swiftly. God has a purpose every time his word goes out. He reminds us faithfully that this word is what has impact. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, for the word of God is quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the uh, soul and your spirit. And is a discerner or a divider of the thoughts and intents of your heart. That's the power of God's word. Uh, yesterday, no, it was this morning we were sitting there. Jen and I were having coffee and she said, you know, it was just like at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the devil standing and dancing saying, we got him, we got him, it's over. All the imps of hell are saying, yes, we've won, we've won. And three days later, he came out of that tomb. History changed itself for 2,000 years. We have been following this one truth that Jesus Christ is risen, risen, and without that, we are of all people most miserable. Now, she didn't say all of that, but she got me kind of fired up on the subject. We hold to that truth. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of God may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is in you. Have you ever considered that in your prayer, that the word of God is glorified in you? This doesn't mean you're glorified in the word. It means the word is glorified in you. People can see the word coming out of you. What's the most important thing you can give any other human being in encouragement? It's the word. Listen, I've walked the hallways in the wee hours of the morning trying to find words to say to people who are at life's end, who are on the bottom, and there ain't no words. There are no words that can substitute for the power of his word. There's just none whatsoever. So he says, finally, brethren, I, I want you to pray that the word may run swiftly. Now, where's the word going? Why does he need it to go somewhere? So we're going to give you four little idea lessons today. The first is the double timing of the word, double time. If you're in the military, you know what I'm about to say. Double time! Whoo! What does that mean? We're going to go fast for a long time. And it's not fun. And we usually got a bunch of stuff on our back jiggling and, and, and a gun. Double timing the word. Run swiftly. I pray that, that I pray that you will pray that the word will run swiftly. Well, where's it going? Where's the word got to get to? What kind of a crisis is he, is he in? Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. Now, again, this is talking about the power of the word as it is sent. You ever hear that little sound when you're sending an email off? I love the sound because it reminds me, it's going to where I sent it. And when God's word is running swiftly to its purpose, wherever it needs to be, it won't return void. It can't. I mean, it cannot be made useless. It cannot be rendered ineffective. It cannot be sterile. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration 
from God. And it is profitable for four things. There are four things you can count on the Bible doing for you every time you hear it. It is profitable for doctrine. Young preachers say we don't need to preach doctrine. That's the problem. You don't got no doctrine. And when you got no doctrine, you got nothing much to preach and nothing much to stand on. It's doctrine. And it's also profitable for reproof. It's also uh, profitable for correction. And it's profitable for instruction in righteousness. Now, there are four stages in, in disciplining a child. The first is doctrine. You need to teach the child right and wrong. This is right. This is wrong. The second phase of child discipline is reproof. Come here. Daddy's about to spank you. The, the, and here's why. The third uh, profitability is correction. The result of that spanking is not so that a little boy or a little girl cries. It is that they will be corrected from a bad behavior. And the fourth profitability is instruction. Now I'm going to teach you what to do right. That's how you discipline a child. That's how you discipline a child of God. So he says, pray. Finally, brethren, pray that the word of the Lord may run swiftly. Now, you just don't consider the word doing that. And you don't think about this, this sort of a context in which God's, God's word, the Holy Bible, is getting where it needs to go and it's getting there swiftly. And so when he prays this, it's double-timing the word. And, and the purpose of that is so that it will accomplish that what it needs. Every one of us needs the word. Every one of us needs the power of his word. Finally, brethren, um, pray that the word of the Lord may run swiftly. So tomorrow, try this uh, in, in whatever frustration you're in. And there's going to be frustration this week. There's, go, there's going to be tenseness this week. Uh, we're trying to figure out why 21,000 troops are there to, pre, pre, to protect when no one's going to allow to be there, what that's all about. And so there is weariness and there is all sorts of fears about what's going on in, in our own country today. But the Word of God has not been of, of made useless. It is powerful and it's sharp and it can do its work in us. So how, how do we... How do we balance the worry and the fear and the frustration that we have with the confidence in God's Word? See, that's, that's why we're here today. We want to be reassured that, wait a minute, I don't care how bad this is looking, and folks, it's looking pretty bad. Uh, you know, but the, the whole concept is I, I need to hear, and I need to hear from God's Word how I can be reassured when the news reporters and the world just continues to pile on saying this is how bad it is. You see, the word's going to run swiftly where it needs to go. Water always runs which way? Downhill. It runs where it needs to go. Uh, plumbers, always they always go to the end of the line. <laughs> Why? Because this stuff just floats downhill. Everything in life is going to float downhill. The Word of God is going to go to its lowest point. The Word of God is going to come to your lowest ebb. The Word of God will get to it. Now, here's, here's what happens, though. If you get so consumed in all of the, the, the Facebook and the Twitter uh, wars that are going on, and they are wars. This, we are in a war. This is, this is unprecedented in American history uh, of the things that are going on. But here's what I'm saying. If you get so caught up in the fight, you'll forget that it is the word that needs to run swiftly, not, not more words. And so you have to get yourself in sort of an attitude. And that's why it lines up for us how to thrive in a new America that does not love God, does not love God's word. Well, first is I got to remember to pray. I have to remember, remember that God's got a word and it will double time to me where and when I need it. Second thing he mentions is, uh, finally, brethren, uh, pray that the word of the Lord will run swiftly and be uh, glorified just as it is in you and that we might be delivered. Point number one is double time the word. Always ask for the word of God to come before anything else comes. Always ask for God to send that word to me. The second thing that we're going to talk about is deliverance that pray not only that the Word of God gets double time to where we need to be, but pray for deliverance. We need to be delivered. When, when Moses stood at the Red Sea, um, in the world's eye, they had him. I mean, Satan had him. This is an impossibility. You cannot cross a sea, and that's true until uh, the Word of God runs swiftly where it needs to go. And the word of God says to him, what? One, one command. And only one person had to have that faith, and that was Moses. 
Everybody else could stand and watch. They got a free pass on this because the, the, the waters were going to part based off the word running swiftly to where it needed to go. See, you may not have to live by faith in the same area that I have to live by faith in, but you have to live by faith that's going to work in your house and going to work in your neighborhood. And that's why uh, when, when Moses stands there, uh, okay, here's a rod, there's an impossibility. But the word says do this. Stepping out on absolutely nothing is what has to happen. Now, deliverance comes. The, the, we all know how Charlton Heston did that. He got them through. Everybody walked through on dry ground. Deliverance. Pray. He says that the word will double time to where it needs to go. And secondly, that we would be delivered. Now, delivered from what? Deliverance. Deliverance from evil. Verse 2 reminds us that there are, there are two types that he's fighting. Now, sometimes I can receive criticism for jumping into political kingdoms and, and realms in my preaching. I understand that. But you have to understand that's where Paul lived all the time. Who's he talking about? And, and pray, folks, that we might be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. You know who this is? It's the Roman government. It's the people who keep following him around and putting him in jail and that he has to keep asking that the word of God may run swiftly and get him out of jail. See, They have become the enemy. But I'll tell you something, they were always the enemy. There's not a government in the world that can say it is of the kingdom of heaven. They're just not. It's an enemy. And so to be delivered from unreasonableness is a is a sight to see when you begin to consider. How many of you have dealt with unreasonable people this week? Unreasonable. You are unreasonable. See, it, this, this is not a, such a far-fetched prayer. This is why Paul is saying, hey, I need you first to pray that the word will run swiftly to get here and do its work, and I need you to pray for deliverance from unreasonable people. Unreasonable. But there's a second sort of evil that's not just unreasonable. Because you see, evil, evil consists in, in, in many units and in many ways. But there's a second portion to evil here found in verse 2. That we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked. There's a difference. Unreasonable. Because some of you are unreasonable at times. Point to a stubborn person. Karen, okay, he, the, the, the camera guy is pointing to his wife and she's pointing to him. We'll start marriage counseling at 3 tomorrow afternoon. Okay, the stubbornness, the, stubborn, the more stubborn that we become in what we hold to being right or what we want to see done is part of the wickedness that we have to overcome. We're all stubborn. We all have a will. We all have a way. We express it differently. All of us express it differently. Some of you express it like this. What's wrong? Nothing. Where do you want to eat? I don't care. What do you want to do? I don't care. What's wrong? Absolutely nothing. So you express it that way. Now, you're a liar. You know you are. This is how you're dealing with that. It be, it, it's, a, it's a force of wickedness. And the, I'm talking to all of us because we, when we watch children do this, we laugh at it. But it's not funny to see a 51-year-old man do it. It's not funny anymore. It's a stubborn will. And, and it, it becomes wicked. So he says, listen, pray that we may be delivered from unreasonableness. These people who keep pounding us, keep putting us in jail, keep slapping our hands and saying we cannot preach the word and that we cannot have a voice. We cannot say, listen, you never dreamed that you would live in an America that would shut you off of a public forum, did you? The, isn't the First Amendment the greatest and grandest of all truths that we have in, in any nation of any freedom sort? Yes, it is. And yet we're watching it. We're, we're seeing it happen. And that's nothing. When, when they control all the airways and you begin to see Christian programming deleted and deleted and deleted and all the, the uh, uh, um, cross air to the other parts of the world, across the ocean, transatlantic lines that we give the gospel back and forth and all of that. When you begin to see that dry up, because once they start this process 
of silencing, then it becomes easier and easier to silence the next person. Now, you know that. But what I'm saying is even in your home, even the way that you respond to one another, if you're all pouted up because you didn't get this way or you didn't get that way, uh, D.L. Moody lived with that a long time. I don't know if you've read any of D.L. Moody's stories. They're wonderful. Uh, one lady at the end of his sermon said, I do not like the way you do evangelism, and I do not like the way you speak. He said, how do you do evangelism? Well, I don't. He said, well, I like my way better. <laughs> All the time being picked and picked and picked and picked and picked by people who just love to be stubborn and prideful about something. Y'all will say, we come in next week and we vote, our church votes, we want to paint this floor green. We're just dying to paint it green. Or half green and half yellow. Yeah. It's unreasonable, but I don't like to deal with unreasonableness. I like to walk around it if I can. So if, you, if you're dying to paint it green and yellow, and, you're, and if you don't get your way, this is, this is how you're going to be, then what we have to understand is Paul's not just talking to the world. He's talking to us in the house, believers in the house. But, but brethren, pray that the word of God will run swiftly and be glorified just as it is in you and that we might be delivered. See, you need deliverance today. I need it. We'd like to be delivered from this mess that we're in. We'd like to hear a finally. We want to put an amen to it. It's sort of like the doctor who you go to and, and you ju he just keeps or she just keeps talking about it and she's edging up toward the shot but they just or the, whatever the, the thing and they just keep talking about it. And then they say, okay, this is going to be a big stick on three. Why three? Why do they do one, two? When I had to get shots every week for, I did for five years every week. Jesus, I get pneumonia every fall. The, the nurse, she would trick me. All right, big stick on three. One, ow! That she knew. I'm saying there's a bunch of owls, there's a bunch of big sticks coming our way, folks. And it will not matter how you feel about it, how angry you are about it. We need deliverance. And where are we going to find it? Who's going to deliver us from this stuff? Only the Word. That's all we got. When you come to the place where I'm all you have, you'll find I'm all you need. So deliverance. We don't talk about it much in this country because we've always thought we're pretty much a delivered on top of do anything, be anything that we want to be. Wickedness comes in two, two sections and two forms, that which is unreasonable and that which is just flat wicked. Our government is wicked. Our government has lied. Our government leaders are doing things that the constitutional fathers are literally rolling over in graves, if that be possible. We know it. They know it. We know that they know that we know that they know it, I think. <laughs> Deliverance. Pray that we can be delivered. Third point. If we look in the double timing of the word, we see a deliverance from evil. Verse 4, he says, and we have confidence in the Lord concerning you. Listen, that needs to be said about you. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you. See, I have confidence in the Lord that you're going to do the right thing. Now, so our third D is doing the right thing. Doing the right thing. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you, folks, that you first do and will do the things we command you. Are you going to do right though the stars fall? Are you going to do right? Right has its own reward in itself. If you pay the kids for taking out trash, you, you have taught a bad example. You've taught a principle that says, I'll negotiate everything in life. Take out the trash because it's the right thing to do. Make up the bed because it's the right thing to do. Clean the car because you're the one driving and riding in it. Soon to be 3 and $4 a, a gallon gasoline. Take care of this thing. Take care of this car. Take care of this stuff. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. We somehow skipped a generation in teaching that right has a reward in itself. That we have to be paid. I didn't ask for $600 stimulus don't, and did not want $600 stimulus. Not that I don't want money. I love the, the thought of, of getting some. But I, what I'm afraid of is we have 
this magic tree that is in Washington, D.C., this magic money tree that no one seems to care about and that we continue to tell people, don't worry about it, just count on us. We're going to take care of you. When that happens and it becomes the mindset, then doing right in itself loses, loses its place. Doing right. He says, listen, we have confidence in the Lord concerning you. You need to put this as you. This is talking to you. I have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you're going to do the right thing. Both now and when things get tough, he says. Both now and when with the future commandments, when they get harder and harder, you're still going to do the right thing. We had a meeting here this week that lasted for over three hours with ministers who are discouraged, who are frustrated, who are angry. Just kind of let it out. Let your hair down and tell it all because of the things that they're, they're having to fight. It's not just a COVID, a COVID mess. It's, well, you know what it is. You've got the same frustrations. No need to waste time there. But what has to happen is it doesn't matter what comes at us. We're going to do the right thing. You've got to be able to be counted on. You're going to do the right thing. Will you do the right thing? You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about doing the right thing. I'm talking about doing the right thing when it's a hard thing to do. Do you ever try to teach children a new habit or a right thing? Do you ever try to train a horse or a dog? Do you ever try to train a guinea pig? It doesn't matter what you're trying to train. You have to make the right thing the easiest thing to do because they're going to do the wrong thing. Children will do the wrong thing. Did you ever have a class? Did this church ever sit down? We need to, we need to have a class on teaching children how to act up and be bad, how to run up and down the stairs. How to throw paper airplanes over the top. That's Becca teaching them all that. You know what I'm saying? Hey, Becca. You don't have to have a class to teach kids to be bad. They're going to be bad. Well, it's in their nature, just as it is in yours. So Paul says, listen, we have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you both now do and will do the things that we command you, the things that are right. Doing right in an impossible world where doing wrong is what everyone else expects you to do. Do you ever get given too much change back, like $20 too much change? And there's two things that always happen in in a spiritual person's mind. The Lord just blessed me. And this ain't right. Amen? The reason you laugh is because that is the moral conundrum that we get into in everything in life. But this is not right. So doing right, regardless, is the reward within itself. And in a culture like ours that has uh, continually brought our standard of living down and yet brought the desires and wants up, We're going to see more and more people steal more and more stuff. We're going to see more and more people want more and more stuff. I love the the Christmas commercial on the car. I think it's a Chevrolet. He uh, he comes in, honey, I've got a surprise for you. She gives him his present. He says, I've got a surprise for you. And he has two sets of keys, a brand new Chevrolet pickup for himself and a brand new uh, whatever it was for her. Only she runs to the pickup and says, I like it. Now, it's a ridiculous commercial, and I don't know a human being. You, you may run with different folks than I do that buy two, uh, somewhere around $200,000 worth of driving stock. Let's treat each other good for Christmas. They end that commercial with this. We're all in this together. I don't even know where your together is. I don't understand that at all. Well, doing right, though the stars fall. Listen, uh, this week I have been in touch with two state uh, are two two uh, senators from Arkansas. One's name's Cotton, the other's name's Bozeman. I've expressed what uh, what thousands and thousands of Arkansans said. And and when I finished up the conversation, I said, you have no idea how angry people are. You have no idea walking the hallways of life and out on the parking lots of life in Arkansas how angry people are. The replies are the same. Um, it's been sent 47,000 times over. We have worked tirelessly. We have done a great job. We have put together a bill that will help. Da, 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 da. Still don't answer the questions. You see, we expect people to do the right thing even though it's hard. 
And we watched it last week. We watched compromise after compromise. But why? Because it's too hard. Your own career is at stake. Your own next move is at stake. Everything is at stake when it comes down to doing right. See? You know everything is built or destroyed on trust? Everything. Everything is built or destroyed on that one word, trust. You either trust me to be your pastor or you don't. If you don't trust me, there's pretty much I can do. There's pretty much not anything I can do right. But if you do, there's pretty much not anything I can do wrong. It all, it all, my wife trusts me and I trust her. That's the way it is. It's got to be. Yeah, but we, we, we got to check. No, you don't. Trust, trust, trust. That's what builds all relationships, and lack of is what destroys all relationships. Do the right thing. Paul says, listen, I'm counting on the Lord. You folks, do the right thing. Folks, it's going to get hard to do the right thing. Trust me. We haven't even begun to see what hard to do the right thing is going to be. Another person I contacted this week, his name is Representative Emmanuel Cleaver. He is, uh, he's in his seventh term as a congressman. He was the mayor of Kansas City for quite a while and uh, has a degree from St. Joseph's Methodist uh, University there in Kansas City, has five honorary doctorates that are all theological, religiously based. Uh, but Emmanuel got up. In the opening of the, of the new session of Congress, the very first thing to happen in the new session of Congress last Sunday, and he said, to the monotheistic God Brahma and all other names by which you... Well, I tweeted him because he's on Twitter, and I said, this is the most asinine thing I have ever heard a so-called minister of the gospel say. Because there is only one God. We know what his name was. It, it is not, his name is not monotheistic Brahma or Brahma. His name is Jehovah Yahweh. Jehovah. He's God. Then I had to recommunicate to him, then I apologized because right after he gave that horrible opening prayer, the worst prayer I've ever heard prayed uh, on the floor of the house. I had to apologize because I said it was the most asinine, the most stupid thing I'd ever heard. But then the boss of the house got up and said, the new rules of the house will be, you will not use gender, ter- you will not say father, mother, sister, brother, son. You will um, substitute non-gender terms in any speaking on the floor of this house. That's why I apologized to Cleaver. I said, now I've heard the most stupid, asinine thing I've ever heard in my life. Okay, here's, here's my point, though. Do right. Do right. You know where they are. Do right. Our, our national, brother, brother Benny, brother Jimmy and I, I I'm, I'm boiling on the inside about our national Southern Baptist Convention leadership. They're silent. Some were down in a hole. Get up and talk to us. Get up and lead. Show us a direction. Give us something. <laughs> Give us something for crying out loud. You're making $175,000 a year. Say something. I'm more angry at Southern Baptist Convention leadership than I am at the liberal Democrats who are running the whole show. Why? Because they know to do right. Though the stars fall, they know to do right regardless of how the world comes against them and regardless of how it may affect your future or your next position. Do right though the stars fall. We've got to get back to teaching our boys and girls in school, in everywhere. If you're a coach, teach them, do right, do right, do right, do right. If you're a a teacher, teach them to do right, do right, do right, hoping that when they get out, they will do right. Paul says, wow, folks, I've got confidence in the Lord now concerning you that you both do now and will do the things that are right. Well, there's one more D. And it's talking about, in uh, verse 5, direction. Now, now, may the Lord direct your hearts into two things, into the love of God and into the patience of Christ, direction. We need directions. It's not good enough for me to stand here and holler and rave and rant for, for 40 minutes. We have to have direction. Churches. All over this country now must find some new directions. We must find some new ways to navigate the world in which we live. We have as many members not able to be here as we have here. We have to think about that. 
We have to try our hardest to keep them connected to some pulse beat, some heartbeat, even though they are, they're not physically here. Then we have another group that is not here that has just become comfortable in not being here. The, what, what was started out as an, as an incident or event has now become a, a comfortable way. Every church is going through that. That's why they're frustrated pastors. There are people who will never come back to church now because they have found a new way. And I'm saying to you, and I've said it over and over and over and over again, online church has its way, has a principle. Many people can't be at church. We're going to stay right on it. We're going to keep doing it uh, as long as we humanly can, as long as Roger and and all the team uh, keep putting it together, editing and getting it out for us. We'll continue to do that. But the church must meet as well physically in here, and we always will. What if another one of those CDC edicts come down and, and, and we got to shut her down again? What if, what if the governor, Asa, says this this week? What if, what, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? What we have to do, folks, is understand this principle now that we're going to meet as a church. Got it? We're going to meet as a church. He's told us to meet, and I think the American church has run so far backwards from COVID-19 that the Holy Spirit is having a hard time to get the word to run swiftly where it needs to go because we keep running backwards, afraid to death that we may get it. And I understand the fear, but what I'm saying is we got to have some direction here. A family with no direction has no future. A church with no direction has no future. A, 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 any, a government with no direction has no future. That's why we're seeing the total dismantling of an American system. Direction. He says, listen, now, I'm, I'm praying, and I have confidence but the, that the Lord will now lead you to two things. And we close with these two things. Direction. The direction of the love of God. The most sustainable principle on the planet is the love of God. For God so loved the world. The most sustainable truth in all of life is the love of God. Without it, nothing moves. Without it, we wouldn't have church. I'd be home right now eating eggs and bacon. Double up on bacon on Sunday. I wouldn't be. Why would I be at church? Who would care? Without the sustaining principle that God loves us, that he loves this world, that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the love of God. He said, now listen, we're going to keep directing your heart into. Because you look at the, the preposition into. They both of them say into. I'm, we're going to direct you into the love of God. Hey, did you ever run cattle down, down in maybe at the sail barn down in the chutes, get them running in a direction, and you run them down in the chutes until you get them in a catch pen or wherever you're trying to get them to? It's the same principle. We're running you down the side walls of these truths, the truth that is running swiftly. We're running you down to get you to a point, into the love of God. The love of God sustains us through everything. The love of God is going to sustain you uh, through every harm that's about to come. What if we run in food shortages? We're going to have them. What if the, what if the supply train breaks down again? We're going to have it. Uh, neighbors helping neighbors. Good people doing right. Helping people without. And uh, the whole principle of this deliverance is going to come in, in such a way that you'll find we can make it. I don't know who wrote the old song, Country Boy Can Survive. I have, who wrote that? Hank Jr.? Hank Jr.? Good Christian man wrote that song, I reckon. <laughs> wisest, thing he, wisest thing he ever wrote. Country boy can survive. We'll make it. And we're going to help many, 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 many more make it who can't make it. But I am, I am kind of looking forward to watching some folks in L.A. and New York City. See how you boys make it. Direction. Into the love of God and out, and into the patience of Christ. Every time Christ could have come back with an answer, he didn't. Folks, they sat there and pulled his beard out, trying to make him talk. He wouldn't talk. Pilate looked at him, slapped him around a little bit, and brought him back and said, don't you know I have a power over you? Don't you know if all you have to do is say a word to me? I can change this whole situation, as every government of every time has ever said. I can make this all right. I can fix this. And Jesus said, you have no power. What my father gets. Into the patience of Christ. 
I know that you know someone who needs patience, and I won't ask you to point to them because y'all really seem to enjoy that kind of thing. (laughs) Patience is not my long suit, and I'll thank you not to pray for me in that. (laughs) Into the patience of Christ. Listen, we're going to, in your direction, we're leading you into that patience. I'm not naturally a patient person. But I have learned through a lot of hard knocks that sometimes you just got to wait on the Lord now. You can't get ahead of anything. So he says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is in you. And that we may be delivered from the unreasonable and wicked men. For not all have faith, but God is faithful in that he will establish you. And he will guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are both to do and will do the things that we command you. And now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Jesus Christ. And he says amen and amen. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed for a moment. You're an honest group. You're a group I love. And, and I feel that same. I feel that. Church is not just about a meeting, coming together, seeing who's here is not here. I've held babies and played with little children this morning, hugged necks and got kisses. It's the best day of the week. But I ask you this now, in the most solemn, holy question, how many of you have great concern about where we are as a nation right now? You have great concern. All right. Trying to find a balance between that great concern and that great assurance. Yes, we are all concerned, upstairs and down. Back in the three to fives in the nursery, we're all concerned. We're concerned for a generation of boys and girls who may never understand what the principles of freedom are, may never understand the greatest generation who fought evil for years and years and died on the shores and died in quiet uh, foxholes and tunnels to keep freedom, all of them praying to the Lord for safety as they put their harm, if the life's in harm's way. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to bring you to the reality that the strength of this church does not rest on the greatness of her preachers. The strength of this church is upon the strength of the prayers as we as saints. If you're in this room and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I don't want to scare you to it because if I mean, if you've heard about hell and that doesn't motivate you, uh, a shortage of food lines sure not going to save you. If you're here this morning without Jesus Christ, right where you stand, and the Holy Spirit speaking to you, you can confess him right now, right where you stand. You can simply say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. You know it, and I know it, and I'm dying and going to hell. I ask you to save me right now. I ask you, Lord, to take that sin, those bad thoughts, the bad mouth, and exchange it for your righteousness, Father. I confess you right now. That's salvation. If you will believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You need to confess him right now, boys and girls. Confess Jesus Christ to be saved. Then do it right where you stand. This is a house filled with people who deeply are concerned about the direction of our government. But you must be equally concerned about the direction of Christianity in America, Christianity in the churches. We are now approaching 10,000 churches that have closed their door and make no plans of opening again. We can't catch up. We can't start enough churches to catch up with that unless the Holy Spirit gets in this, in this culture like he's never done before. Then we can do all things through Christ. Our concerns are great, but listen, be reassured now. 
be reassured that the Word of God is going to run swiftly to where it needs to go. He'll give you direction if you'll seek Him. Do the right thing every time. Do the right thing though the stars fall. And there'll be deliverance for you. This church needs to pray this morning. As Pastor Jimmy already said, not only just for our church leaders, but our national leaders and the patriots who are standing on Congress floors and walls and halls of the Senate trying to hold an America together that is bound to get apart. We need to pray and pray and pray. I'll stop speaking. If you've confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to walk this aisle and tell one of these good men, I just prayed to receive Jesus. We won't embarrass you. We won't ask you to make a speech. We'll just pray with you and show you how to live that life in Jesus Christ. You come as you need to. But there's a room full of folks who need to get on their knees now and pray to the Father for deliverance. Not only as a nation, but as a family. The greatest thing a person could be called 200 years ago was a patriot. And now have you noticed how that word has resurfaced back into our life ecology? A patriot. Church leaders are even backing away from, don't use that word patriot because it confuses people. It puts nationalism and the flag in in with your Christianity. But a patriot is someone who stands when everyone else is falling. Father, we need heavenly help today. May your run, may your word run swiftly to where it needs to go. May there be deliverance from unreasonable people. May there be deliverance from wickedness. May we do the right thing as we've never done before. May we stand for right as we've never stood before. And may we have direction from your Holy Spirit on how to lead our family tomorrow. Where our groceries are going to come from where our gas is going to get to. May we find direction from your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. I close our prayer asking those of you who are burdened, who are concerned, make make an altar right where you are, right where you stand. Turn around and use the pew. But those of you who feel led to come to an altar to pray for this nation, to pray for your family, or to pray for that lost one that you are so burdened about, this is your time to respond into that. you in.